Welcome to Shoreline Conversations. This is episode 18 of the podcast. I'm Thomas, your host temporarily uh, during the stay-at-home orders here in uh, Monterey. We are doing the podcast remotely, so Cole, our usual host, is taking a break, and I'm just handling it here while we go through our uh, our tactics series here. And so we're back with Dennis, and we're going to go through a couple different tactics today. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll just we'll just get right into it. Dennis, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Having too much fun. <laughs> there you go. Well, we've talking about a, a handful of tactics. We talked about the Colombo tactic. We talked about um, how to deal with self-destructing arguments, um, and then last week we talked about a tactic called um, that uh, Greg Kukul in the book Tactics, which is you know what the series is based off, calls taking the roof off. And uh, this is the book for all of our viewers here. You can see it. Um, so our our next tactic is called Steamroller. Can you give us a, a little preview, or not a preview, but a, a summary? What it, what is the Steamroller tactic? Well, it's a tactic that Kokel designed to deal with folks who literally try to roll over you. And think of a steamroller. Maybe uh, the viewers have seen a construction site where a road or some long parking lot's being paved, and there's this giant roller machine that's compressing uh, the asphalt. And in the ancient days, they used steam. But regardless, the steamrollers are around today rollers are around. And the idea is when you watch one, it's unstoppable. It's relentless. It just keeps moving forward. And it looks like nothing in its path can stop it. And that's what can happen with certain people. When you're trying to have a conversation, they sort of steamroll you. There's an aggression. There's a relentlessness. There's a um, a persistence to just go forward no matter what. There's very little listening. Um, there's constant interruptions that may come from more than one person or more than one angle all at once. And it's one of the easiest things to get derailed by in a conversation or an attempted conversation. Not knowing what to do. This thing's coming at me. Their questions, their presentation, their energy, maybe their anger, maybe hostility. What do I do? What do I do? Mm. And it isn't just in these kind of conversations. Remember, all of these tactics can be transferable to relationship things in life. This one, I think, is especially useful in other scenarios beyond conversations about the gospel. Right, right. Yeah, I think uh, I think people in relationships or even just friendships, uh, uh, we've all encountered a steamroller. I've, I've probably been guilty of being one before. Um, how do we, is there, a, is there a difference between a steamroller and somebody speaking with passion? Is there, or, or can those things bleed into each other? Maybe, is there a cause and effect relationship? How do we, uh, you, you know, because I'm a, I'm a passionate person when I, when I talk about things. Um, and often I will get very animated and then I realize the person's kind of like, oh, oh and, and I have to like, oh, reset myself, you know, like, oh man, I. Am I being am I being that steamroller? How do I what, what's how do I separate like the passion I have for this between be, being that steamroller or or if I'm on the other side, how do I differentiate? Is this person just being re- very passionate or are they or are they falling into the steamroller category? It's a good question, Thomas. So I think it really comes down to what is the nature of a conversation. By definition, a conversation is an exchange of ideas and information between at least two parties back and forth. So listening is a critical part of that. A person can be passionate when it's their turn, but still be a good listener. But a steamroller simply doesn't. By definition, they're relentless. They don't pause. They just keep going forward with their own agenda. I don't think being passionate passionate necessarily means you're a steamroller at all. Beautiful. So it's it's how they re- watching how they react when it's your turn. To speak exactly is, is a good or even if you get a turn or if you're you already realize there isn't gonna be any turn for me in this <laughs> then you know you're Got with it. a steamroller you're dealing with the steamroller you're in the path okay yeah. so uh so that's what a steamroller is how do we deal with that if we find ourselves in that situation well we've, we've got a again, steamroller because a hands. steamroller is powerful and aggressive our response has to be firm and strong important 
It's firm and strong, not rude, not hostile, not demeaning, not dismissive, none of those things. Yet it has to be firm and strong. So Coco gives us three steps and I'm going to walk through those steps, uh, but I'm also going to add some other stuff All right, that I just love it. I think is helpful relationally. So the first step is stop him or stop her. And he would say that he uses hand signals at times, time out. So if you're with a steamroller, first move is a, excuse me, a time out, stop them. And of course, you're going to watch and see if they stop at all. But if they, if they do, good for you. Then you can move to things like this. I'm only able to talk about one thing at a time, so let's pick one. Or I, I have some things I'd like to say. Is it okay if you stop and let me say those things? And, and you simply get them to stop and, and probe and see if there's going to be space for you in a conversation with them. Mm -hmm. But you need to stop them. That's really critical. So you find a way to stop them, or if they're relentless without any pause in their grammar, in their conversation, then you just may have to intervene and say, whoa, 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 time out, time out. Now, I often do that when I'm counseling couples at times, high conflict couples, I may say, hold it, hold it right there. If you need to do that, go ahead and do that. Do it politely, but firmly. You do it verbally or verbally and with a signal like, oh, ho, oh, wait a minute. I'd like to respond or there's something I'd like to share or something I'd like to say. When you do that, you have to be very careful not to let hostility creep into your voice. And so if you're going to do that, check with yourself quickly before you do and say, am I grounded? Am I okay? Am I hostile? Am I feeling like attacking? What am I feeling like? And if you feel like you're going to be super defensive or hostile in attack mode, you might just go to the third step, and that is leave them. Go. Or you might even say, wait a minute, I got to go away and gather myself because I don't like how I'm feeling right now. You might do that. But in many cases, when I've used this, most people respond to the stop him or stop her first stage one of dealing with a steamroller. Most do. Now, what happens if they don't respond to that? Then you go to shame them. Now, <laughs> as a therapist, I don't easily use the word shame. Coco's comfortable with it, but I don't easily do that. Um, but the idea that I think he's presenting is you, you make a petition and you kind of point out to them what's happening. And so I'll say, when, I'm, when I have to go to step two and I'm trying to get them to stop and they're not stopping, I'll say, all right, in the shame them step, I'll just say, all right, look, I need to know if this is going to be a conversation. I, I need to know. Take a moment and let me know. Are we going to be able to have a conversation here? Because there's things I'd like to share. I've listened to you without interrupting. Are you going to be able to listen to me without interrupting? So the idea is put the ball in their court. You know, give it back to them. Say, all right, here's something. Consider this. Tell me what your thoughts are about what I'm giving to you. See, if we don't do that, what we do is we take it all on ourselves, and then we do all the thinking in our head, and that usually builds up a little resentment and maybe a lot of hostility. So I, I don't want to get trapped in this sense of why are they doing this? What's the matter with them? Do they know how they're coming across? Listen to them. What's wrong with these people? They won't even let me talk. Inactivity is your fault. Mm. All right. If I'm inactive, it's my responsibility. So I do act. I'll say, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on a second. I just want to know. See, I'm not saying my point of view yet. I want to know if they can stop and let me have a place for my point of view. And then I'm going to wait, pause and ask them. And you might ask, what if they don't even recognize that you did that? They just keep going. Well, you got your answer. You yeah. got it indirectly. They didn't state it in those words, but it's very clear they're going to keep going. For whatever reason, if someone says no, they're not going to give you space, or I don't want to, or you can't make me stop, or you got to listen to me, 
or they don't even recognize what you're doing, then you go to the third phase and that's leave them. And you can say something. I like to say, I do like to say something. Some just walk away, but I like to say something. I like to make a statement like, all right, this isn't working for me. I'm I, I'm really, I'm, I'm not going to stay in this right now. So perhaps another time I'm going. Now you notice what I said in there. Mm-hmm. I didn't point the finger at them at all. I didn't say, look at how you're acting. Look at what you're doing. You know, see my finger gets closer. See you, <laughs> you, you, you. That's inflammatory of its own accord. And I could do that. I could move into their space and say, look how you're acting. What's the matter with you? Maybe you don't do those things, but you know what? I've been a counselor a long time and we often do those things. We get into that negative space and we want to duke it out. We want to make them listen, make them stop, make them do stuff. I'm advocating the opposite. So to walk through it again, you, you've tried to stop them. Nothing worked. You tried to shame them. Say, look, are you going to even let me into this conversation? Are we going to have an exchange of ideas? And if they either don't respond or just say no way or say yes, but then press forward, you've got your answer. Then you leave them. And when you leave them, language is important. Why is it important? Well, number one, you're not going to do this, the blame thing. And you want to leave the opportunity for maybe talking in the future. But if you get into a, a fight, if you sense hostility creeping in your voice and you dump a little bit of it there, the odds of you having a future exchange diminish quickly. Right. And you'll have some accountability for that. So I want to be able to come back at some point and maybe check back. Why? Maybe they're in a bad space. Maybe this isn't how they normally do it. Maybe I put a rock in their shoe. Maybe maybe they'll be more amenable or open another time. Mm-hmm. So I'll say, yeah, I'll say, all right, I'm not able to do this or I'm not going to stay in this and I'm going to go now and I hope we can connect another time. So notice I talked about what I'm going to do, what I'm feeling, and in no way accuse them of anything. Even if you believe it's all them, Saying it will close the door to the future more likely than not. So those are the three steps in the steamroller. Got it. So uh, I, I'm with you on the, uh, I, I did, when I read the the second phase, the shame him, uh, not not the best choice of language uh, in my opinion, but but I, it, it does kind of highlight what what is it about um, about that that's so effective, and, and I mean. We all know shame can be effective, usually for worse. But in getting somebody who who may never have been confronted on this, uh, uh, highlighting this, what can that do to the conversation? Or, or even if you find yourself somebody asking you, you know, obviously in in relationships, uh, romantic relationships, a lot of times you're so close with that person that it's it's when they say that it's it's so easy to just like roll your eyes it, it, it's uh the irony of the closer you are to somebody the harder it is to maybe take that uh that shame moment seriously but in a conversation with somebody else how does highlighting that kind of reset the conversation uh, uh i guess is is the question there well that's a great question because there's a number of things operating here number 1 if, if you say, I can't be in it, you've set a boundary. And what this person is learning, whether they could, you know, verbalize this or not at a later time, what they're learning is, if I talk with this person, again, there's terms of engagement. Threatening to stop a conversation, threatening to say you won't do anymore, yelling at the other person, blaming them, counterattacking is no boundaries at all. It defines no terms of engagement at all. But if I let someone know, hey, um, with the, with the uh, second phase, shame them, or I asked and you confirm there's no way that I'm going to be in the conversation, either in your words or in your actions. Now I'm letting you know, I won't be in the conversation. They learned something about you. If they come and talk to you again, or you go and talk to them again, it's sitting right there. And if you say it again, they're going to be very clear, you will do it. Because you did it. You see, when I teach boundaries with people, I say, if you have an area 
where you want to set a boundary, don't ever present the boundary and tell them what you're going to do if they don't stop or they continue something. And then if they just move on, they keep going regardless and you don't hold the boundary, you're worse off than if you never set one. Mm. Because now they don't believe what you say in the future about a boundary or the terms of engagement. So that's one thing that's very important. Um, the other thing that's really important is you're you're dealing with the process of the communication and not the content. If someone's blasting you right away, if they're calling you names, you're not in the conversation anyway. But if they're just rolling out their content, here's the facts. Here's the way it is. Here's the truth. Here's the this, this, this claim after claim, assertion after assertion. That's content. But if you try to be in the conversation, they won't let you. That's process. So what you're learning is the way the conversation is working or not working is the real exchange between us, the real connection between us. The material can't even get on the table because we don't have a method or a manner in which to hear the material. Right. We don't. Right. So process is everything in communication. It's everything. I've been teaching it for years. I ask my wife about it regularly. How am I doing with sharing stuff with you? Is it a way you can hear it? Because, man, I just might blurt out or talk about things or whatever. Are you okay with the way I'm doing it? Delivery is everything. Like I've said in other podcasts on the pizza story, you know, the pizza delivery story. Contents the pizza. How you deliver the pizza is the real message. Yep. And that's and a, so that's a good distinction. Here. Yeah. Yeah. And, and something like... Um last week's tactic the taking the roof off would be a, a content i mean all of these are processed to a certain degree but uh a more content heavy you know thing would be you know uh looking at the evidence and and we use that analogy of building the house and pointing out where the walls are that's you're you're, you're really deep into the content this is almost like you said it's almost all process i feel like that's a good distinction as we go through these tactics to ask yourself uh, is this process or is this content? Um, which brings uh, kind of the last question here before we move on. Um, how how focused should we be on the process uh, versus the content? Is there an order there? Is it content first, then process? Process first, then content? Um, are they equally valuable? Is one uh, The pizza analogy you just used implies maybe the process is even more important than the content. Can you speak a little bit of that? Yeah, I do. I I have a bias. I'm biased towards process. If you don't have a good process, con content becomes irrelevant quickly. Hmm. You you can't even get it on the table. You can't even get it in the conversation in a meaningful way. So I think process is a key. And one of the examples I use, Thomas, also is when I look at countries that are trying to uh, finalize an elaborate, extensive trade deal, or countries that are trying to arbitrate or you know, negotiate a temporary truce. We, the viewing or listening public or the news reading public, we get the news of the final peace agreement or the final trade agreement. Oh, breaking news. The ministers of these two countries sat down and agreed on this trade or agreed on this truce. But a little bit of work behind the scenes helps you understand that their teams have been meeting for months. And what are they doing? They're looking at content even more so. They're looking at the process by which information will be put on the table. Mm. Some examples are for, if a businessman is going to do uh, business in Japan and he's, uh, you know, California born and bred business person, never been there. They need to get a little bit of training on what you do, because if you go to a business meeting in Japan and you don't like what's across it being said across the table and you just stand up and say, I'm not going to. I'm not going to stay in this meeting anymore. You've committed a horrifying violation. That's a process violation. But what does it communicate to your partners? You dislike us. You dishonor us. You're against us. You don't understand us. You don't want to do business with us. Mm -hmm. So I take those examples and I put them into relationship counseling. We need to have the terms of agreement reasonably established before people are going to be able to hear content. And that varies from person to person and connection to connection, conversation to conversation, 
relationship to relationship. So where do I check first? Me. I always check me first. I think it's biblical. It's counsel you get from any trained counselor or any lay counselor at Shoreline. <laughs> I would say, always look here first. Am I going to use the right words? Am I going to have the right tone? Am I going to send the right signals? And what are the signals? I value you, person that I'm talking to. I value you. And if you don't value the person, they will sense that you don't value them. Now, whether they can articulate or even know what they're feeling or not, I can't say. But I'll tell you something. They'll know they're feeling something. And it, and it, and it uh, disfavors the conversation. It really does. It, it harms the conversation. So the first place is I start with me, and then I evaluate them. How are they doing? And if I feel like, you know, they're ardent, they're passionate, but they're informed, and they've got some things to say, I'm going to listen. I don't feel they're harming me personally in any way. Mm -hmm. They are passionately sharing their information. I'm in. I don't care whether I agree with it or not. I can hear it. But if they turn on me in any way, then what? Well, whenever someone comes at us, our own defensiveness is going to creep in. And that's where we have to watch watch it. And that's where Coco will say, if that's happening, the likelihood that you're going to be hostile in return is going to increase dramatically. And you will not do a conversation well. Yep. Maybe even do some harm in it going forward. Beautiful. Well, let's move on to our uh, next our next tactic. Uh, it's called the Rhodes Scholar. That's what uh, uh, Kukul calls it. So, uh, explain to us what is what's the Rhodes Scholar tactic? Well, this is the idea. Think think of being in a um, a scenario where there's someone sharing or speaking, and they are someone with the credentials. They got the doctorate, multiple doctorates, published you know, a radio show or whatever, and they make some statement. I like the example Coco uses because I notice it every holiday, every holiday season. I'm in the line at Safeway or Whole Foods or whatever, and there's a magazine cover that says, myth of the resurrection busted. Scholars agree that it's all a ruse or Bible exposed as fantasy written by Weird little people in 1912 or something <laughs> in this weird club drinking club. I don't know. Wow. I, I, I really want to read that, to be honest. That sounds. I, I just, <laughs> you don't want to spend two minutes in my brain, brother. That's where all this stuff comes from. Anyway, <laughs> but the idea is those magazine headlines, they came out every Christmas season to expose, allegedly, scholars say. So if you read the contributors to the article, it's like the Jesus Seminar in the late 60s, early 70s. This group of scholars that allegedly, here comes a quote marks, debunked the words of Jesus in the gospel and decided that he only spoke about 35% of what we think he said. Well, well, they published. It's similar to the headlines on these articles. So it's about credentials. When we use the Rhodes Scholar technique, we're going to the next step and we're saying, what are the specific reasons for your opinion? What are the facts you're relying on? I'd love to hear them. Share those with me. I want to find out their reasons and reasoning for declaring this, for claiming this. Because that's a whole different ballgame. Mm -hmm. And so Coco uses the example in his book, and I like this too, of, you know, 20 Nobel Prize winners weigh in on stem cell research. And one, and these are headlines that were in newspapers, one says, it's going to be great for the economy. The research and opening up the doors of research. Well, the guy's a biologist. He's not an econ economist. But if we don't ask, well, how does he think this? Where did he get that? We sign off on the credentials. Well, you know, Nobel Prize winner, everything he says is solid gold. Mm -hmm. And so what we're using in Rose Scholar is I'm not settling for that. Uh -uh. I'm going to ask more questions. I just like, you know, just honest questions, nicely asked. I'd like to know your reasons and the facts you cite and where you got them. 
how you arrived at this. Could you give me some more information about your opinion? Because this is a, a very strong opinion. I'd like to know. <laughs> Another one that comes up for me now, using credentials that don't fit, is NBA All-Star comments on beef and the cow industry and how it just needs to stop. <laughs> well, okay. I'll listen to you if you listen to me coach you on how to shoot the three from beyond the arc. Why would you listen to me? Well, I have an MFT, a master's degree, and I've done some post, you know, some graduate research and some doctoral work about basketball. No, but so this is the same principle. Mm. We don't settle for that. It's not good enough for us. So you're talking about, about, um, somebody who's an expert in an area, but it's not the area you're talking about, or you're right. talking about, okay. Okay. So what about somebody who is, um, what about, so you mentioned like the, the Jesus seminar in the sixties. Yeah. Many of those were new Testament scholars. So they yeah. were in a field that fit the claim, or at least it was the same category as the claims they were making. Um, do we have to do is is there do we handle those differently is kind of what I'm asking. Right, we do. So there's another way to look at it. Um, by the way, material and books came out after they published that sort of debunked their whole process. Mm -hmm. So process is another issue here. What we look at the Jesus seminar scholars, did any of them come in unbiased? And the books written after they published exposed that no, they didn't. They'd had a long history of doubting all of it. So the bias, to a significant degree, guided their investigation and what they published. So that's one thing we look at. H how unbiased can someone be going into research if they have an a priori, meaning a prior position established and known? So I want to know that, too, when I look at what a scholar publishes. Now, somebody could say, on the other hand, well, Dennis, when you read uh, things like Biblical Archaeological Review or Archaeology Review, you have a biased position. I said, yes, I do. I have a biased position. All right. But I also am looking at facts and evidence. That's what I'm looking at. I want all the evidence I can get. Mm -hmm. And my position, even as a biased uh, you know, explorer of facts and stuff archaeologically uh, calls me to be objective about the evidence that's revealed. So there's a priori positions that I want to look at, even when I'm looking at a biblical scholar. I want to know, so what, in other words, the, the Jesus Seminar people had a working hypothesis going in. Our belief is our research will demonstrate that. So let me give you two examples of the opposite. C.S. Lewis and Josh McDowell. Josh McDowell wrote the book, and I have three of his new revised copies. Answers to questions, tough questions skeptics ask about Christianity. And his uh, previous volumes, uh, that are great scholarly works are called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And, jo and uh, uh, C.S. Lewis, of course, wrote Mere Christianity, among many things, but Mere Christianity, um, which is a phenomenal work exploring the validity and truth of Jesus Christ and the gospel. Both were uh, very sharp, acknowledged, brilliant men whose initial journey was a biased journey to disprove the gospel and finally put this to rest, as was the journey of, of a uh, Lee Strobel, a case for Christ, his initial effort when he got sick of hearing about Christianity from his wife and other people was, I'm going to show him. And he went after facts and evidence. All three of these men, highly esteemed, were shocked and stunned by what they learned and found. So, that's part of my sense of one of the things that happens with biblical scholars. Mm -hmm. So if someone tells me, well, Dennis, I have to tell you, my son is a biblical scholar at this university, 
and he doesn't agree with uh, the resurrection at all. I'll say, so? Now, my first, my next choice is, do I want to find out about this or just honor his comment and say, okay? Mm-hmm. So, so if, you, you're, go ahead. Go, go ahead. ahead. So you're well, not, I'm going to dig, I'm going to dig into his background and find out what his bias is right. and what his reasoning is too. So, and, and when we're looking at biases, um, uh, acknowledging that we have our own, um, you're not saying that we, that, that we just don't even bother listening, that it's not even worth, uh, uh anything to, to, to contend with their ideas. I mean, cause we could use, I know, uh, Bart Ehrman, he's a new Testament scholar, uh, uh, started out as a Christian, started out as a pastor yeah. and he went down the journey and the opposite happened. And he yeah. writes books about how the new Testament is, uh, um, uh, not fabricated, but how it's not the Christian's belief of it. Uh, that there's a lot of issues with it. Mm-hmm. Does the fact that he started as a pastor but went down does that give his his view more weight, or or how do we how do we because we can go back and forth with this person and that person, this person. When you're looking at expert voices, as we say, there are we're going to be bombarded with 500 different ones who have 500 different journeys. How do we navigate those seas without having kind of an easy, uh, well, their bias kind of answer? While I agree with with your sentiment about bias, um, how do we? It, it's it doesn't really work in the sense of like an overarching uh, a blanket, right? Because everybody's biased. Right, everybody is. So that's a good point. So what I do is I need to go back to the evidence and the facts, and. So you know the difference in the court system between um, civil law and criminal law. Mm -hmm. Criminal law requires 12 votes one way or the other. Civil law is 9 out of 12, called a preponderance of evidence. So that's what I look at. That's how one of the reasons I accepted the resurrection of Christ initially was. I looked at the work of some of the doubters and realized that there was very few who said he didn't exist. I couldn't find any. Very few who who refuted that he died at the time that I did this 34 years ago. Islam was not in our popular consciousness, and Islam says he didn't die on the cross. But all the other historians I read, even atheists, said, "Well, he died," and they said he was buried, and they agreed the tomb was empty. The only dispute was what happened. So I thought, all right. So I got some pieces of this on the table. These are facts. This is an evidence. It it it. It survives the examination of historical evidence and anthropological evidence and um, historical antiquity. It survives all the tests. So the only question is, how did the tomb get empty? So I dug into that and I looked at Josh McDowell's work, The Resurrection Factor. So I always recommend that people do that. They tell me if they're not convinced and am I biased, you're biased. I'll say, yes, so don't, you know, if, if you're done listening to me, do your own journey. I believe validation of scripture and validation of the gospel story has plenty of evidence. I believe it it, it, it is proof worthy Mm -hmm. that people can discover facts enough to not only do a civil civil conviction, but a a full-on 12 to nothing conviction. So it's about getting a breadth, a breadth of input rather than, it's not that we ignore the expert opinion it's that we don't just take one as as a uh, objective truth it's exploring okay this is what they say let me look at the other sides here and then formulate an opinion based on like you said a like a civil case where we okay what's the consensus here between multiple points of views you're kind of acting as the as the judge or the jury i guess well i'm assessing and evaluating in a way and the thing is, the conclusion's critical. It's like I've said before, and I don't know if we said it in this podcast, but to paraphrase C.S. Lewis, Christianity, if untrue, is of no importance. Christianity, if true, is of ultimate importance. The only thing it can't be is moderately important. So, so I want people, go as far and as strongly and as widely as you have to to get what you need in, if you're searching, mm. you know, there's because I believe the Bible can withstand criticism, 
the resurrection, the truth of it can withstand criticism. And I believe there's more, there's a preponderance of evidence to prove all of it. I believe that. So I don't dissuade people. They ask me, I'll say, no, keep looking. And if you want, I'll give you some resources and, and help you with it. Mm -hmm. And this, and, and that kind of conversation is probably the context of, of the conversations that we, we talk about with tactics, where you're having that conversation, they're saying, well, um, I mean, you just mentioned the resurrection. So uh, you're saying you have good evidence for the resurrection. They're saying, well, I have good evidence against it. Um, and, th and this is why, you know, we're learning these tactics. But yep. let's uh, speak just a little bit about how um, we're all lay people. Well, not all of us. Uh, most of these conversations, we will be lay people in. Um, right. I, you know, I'm not a New Testament scholar. You're not a New Testament, or not not your as you you are more than I am. But but if I'm speaking this to one of my buddies who's not a New Testament scholar, and I'm not a New Testament scholar, and he's bringing up uh, this guy and this guy and this guy say this, and I'm bringing up well this guy and this guy. How do we as lay people handle these expert? So we're still in the Rhodes Scholar thing. How do we? handle these all these expert opinions when we ourselves are not experts? That's a great question, Thomas, and I believe I'm uniquely postured to answer that question. I do, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I'm sort of Joe Average when it comes to all of this. I've been teaching Bible to Man for over 15 years. Um, I'm teaching tactics. Um, I'm doing all kinds of fun stuff. I've never gone to seminary. I'm Joe Average. I'm a guy that just was interested, so I've gone about looking for more information and exploring and being willing to hear skeptics. I don't, I don't go, oh, no, skepticism, it'll derail me. I, I, I don't do that at all. I say, well, this guy's got a point of view. He's hearting about it. I'm going to see what he's got to say. Mm -hmm. or, or I come across a YouTube, why the Bible's all baloney. I'm going to listen to this. I want to know why they think what they think. So my, my sense is, if, if I can go seek things, and I began seeking all this knowledge, here we go, don't turn off viewers, before the internet existed. Oh, no. Yes. I would actually buy imagine. books, and I would go to the library, that old dusty place in each city where nobody goes. <laughs> the what? The, I, the library? I've. Yeah, I don't know. It's some place. Uh, I don't know. But here's the thing. There, it's never been easier for people to learn and grow and find knowledge than it is today. But you know what I would recommend? If you're going to do that, if you're watching this and you feel like you're me in a way, you're, you're, you're not trained, but you want to learn more, partner up with somebody. Okay, partner up with someone and, and maybe somebody who just you see as has a little wisdom and can kind of help guide you. All right. Do that with someone else, because I've done it with a number of partners over the years, and I have people I partner with right now. I feel like, you know, it's a it's a hairy, it's a hairball of a world out there with knowledge flying everywhere. I, I want a little bit of structure in my journey. I am searching all the time. I listen to podcasts, I read materials, I buy books all the time. Because I want to grow. I want to know. So I would encourage everybody watching or listening to this, do that for yourselves. The average person can do this. Beautiful. So we went over the steamroller tactic today and how to uh, uh, kind of respond to somebody who's who's steamrolling you, as they say. And we learned a little bit about Rhodes, the Rhodes Scholar tactic, about not falling into the trap of um, uh, the fallacy of an expert witness, not that we ignore them either, but that as lay people ourselves, we kind of search for a more expansive view for other viewpoints. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you very much for going through this with always, us. Our, always fun. Indeed, our next episode will be the last in tactics. We're gonna go over the last two tactics. Um, yeah, well, we'll see you next week. And once again, Dennis, thank you very much. My pleasure. Looking forward to it. Take care. Whether you're watching on our YouTube channel or listening on your podcast app, make sure to subscribe to hear more of our weekly episodes. Thanks for listening.